one of the covers that was most famous, certainly got the most notoriety um, under your tenure, was showing Mark Zuckerberg beaten and bruised. Um, and yet, if you did that cover today, you probably would have added a, f a few more marks to his face. What kind of a corporate citizen is Facebook and is Mark today, in your view? So that was in 2018. Um, and I, you know, it was a story about you know, what had happened to Facebook, you know, basically following the election in 16 through the following year. And it was a story about a company that was trying to figure out its role in society, it was a company struggling to understand itself. And, you know, the sort of the arc of the story described the way that Facebook, in a desperate attempt to um, appease or keep Republicans at bay, willfully blinded itself to what was happening on the platform during the election. So at the end of that story, there's a long section about the algorithmic changes that Facebook was making. And um, they were doing something called meaningful social interactions. And the idea then was they were going to change the core algorithm of the newsfeed to prioritize reactions among family and friends. And the idea was to make Facebook better, to solve, like this would be a way to solve some of the fake news problems, some of the Russian misinformation problems, some of the sort of the hostility problems. And so that cover of Zuckerberg, beaten and bruised, he's actually smiling. So we took an image of Zuckerberg, we got an actor, we beat up the actor, we put makeup on him so it looked like he was beat up, we merged them together, and then we flipped the mouth, right, to make it look like it was smiling, to try to convey a little bit the sense in the story, the optimistic last section of the story. So that was our story as it ran in 2018. Those algorithmic changes, the things that made up the last section of the piece, we finally know what their effect is because of the documents released by the whistleblower. And it turns out that those algorithmic changes were totally baleful. They actually didn't do anything good. What happened was by prioritizing comments and engagement across friends and family, it seemed to fill Facebook with actually more posts where people were just screaming at each other and like posts where people would um, say toxic things, you know, did very well under those algorithmic changes. So it's quite interesting to me that in retrospect- Which you think was intentional? No, it wasn't intentional at all. I'm completely convinced it wasn't intentional. I think in some ways, my view of Facebook, I'm like much more, strangely, for the guy who put a bloody Mark Zuckerberg on the cover, I am much more a defender of Facebook than, you know, the vast majority of my colleagues in journalism in that I don't think- I don't think the intentions were ever malevolent or I don't think they were ever, I think they just created something they couldn't control. Um, and I think they didn't grasp what was happening until too late. And then I don't think the measures they took were you know, enough. And I don't think they understood the core problem. And, and, and to be fair, there's nothing the whistleblower said directly that would lead you in any other direction than that, right? Yeah, I mean, the whistleblower actually, you know, in a way has a view of Facebook somewhat similar to mine in that, yeah. you know, as she said, you know, Frances Hogan goes on in the testimony and she says, look, I don't want to destroy Facebook. I want to fix Facebook. Right. And my view is the same. The problems that Facebook creates are fixable. And I'm extremely interested in those solutions. I don't just dismiss Facebook as, you know, some evil tobacco company, you know, poisoning our minds.